The threat of a militarized police state is pervasive in our society, especially in science fiction. The fear of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Absolute power corrupting absolutely. The machine built to protect you now pointed at you. But seldom is the question asked, what if that wolf was actually a good doggo? Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Airwolf. Wolf is a live-action American television series that aired on CBS for 55 episodes over three seasons from 1984 to 1986, and then another 24 episodes on the USA Network in 1987. It was like Knight Rider, but with a helicopter. Like Street Hawk, but with a helicopter. Like Blue Thunder, but with a different helicopter. Airwolf is a prototype helicopter designed and built for the military. On the outside, it looks like a regular civilian helicopter with a Shamu evocative paint job and a few cosmetic flourishes. But as indicated by the flight crew's insignia, this flying sheep is actually a wolf. That's why they called the show Sheep Wolf. That's why they called the show Bat Sheep. That's why they called the show Fly Wolf. Machine guns hidden in the wings, missile pod hidden under the underside of the fuselage that could fire missiles or rockets or drop bombs, 3D topographical imaging, tactical countermeasures like flares and chaff, radar and radio jamming, resistance to radar detection or stealth, bulletproof body and windows, increased computer-aided flight control system allowing for maneuverability uncharacteristic of a helicopter, jet, engines, all that, and turbo boost. Developed by a division of the CIA known as The Firm, Airwolf was a secret project that even the US government didn't know about. It was stolen by its designer, Charles Henry Moffat, during a performance demonstration for a US senator. Charles immediately used Airwolf against his benefactors, destroying the test facility, killing everyone inside, and seriously injuring the head of the program for The Firm, a man named Michael Coltsmith Briggs III, AKA Archangel. Stringfellow All Hawk. Stringfellow Hawk is awesome. Michael Coldsmith Briggs the Third is f terrible. That's all going in. All right, fine. Moffat makes his way to then-relevant American pop culture punching bag Libya, where Momar Gaddafi provides him with refuge from American pursuit, dancing girls, swimming pool, food, drink, lodging, and a mostly secure airwolf parking space. All he has to do is the occasional favor for Gaddafi, like shooting down some French military aircraft or sinking an American Navy ship. Enter Stringfellow Hawk, a man blessed with one of the coolest fictional character names ever conceived. Recluse, cellist, art appreciator, dog dad, Vietnam War veteran, one of the test pilots for the Airwolf program, and harbinger of death. Archangel, on behalf of the firm, makes Stringfellow an offer that he can't... No, wait, I'm sorry. That he does refuse. Stringfellow doesn't want the million dollar reward for recovering Airwolf. He wants information that he knows the US government has about his brother Sinjin, who's been missing in action since he was lost on a mission in Vietnam, a mission that Stringfellow himself was a part of. Stringfellow's entire life has been a trail of the people close to him, the people he cares about most, dying in tragic ways that has left him scarred by the trauma. The only person he lets into his life is his surrogate father, fellow military veteran and helicopter pilot, and his current employer, Dominic Santini. Working with Archangel and the firm, Hawk and Santini execute a plan to recover Airwolf from Qaddafi's compound and return it to American soil. However, Hawk and Santini know that they can't just hand it to the US government. They'll never get the answers they need about Stringfellow's brother. Instead, they rig Airwolf with a self-destruct function that only they can deactivate and hide it in a secret mountain cave that only they know the location of. In exchange for funding, information, and continued pressure on the US government to find out what happened to Stringfellow's brother, they agreed to work with Archangel on missions for the firm. Airwolf was created by Donald P. Belisario after a failed attempt to create a similar show as a spinoff from his very successful series Magnum P.I. Donald was already a veteran television writer, creator, and producer, having worked with television producing icons like Glenn A. Larson and Stephen J. Cannell. Television audiences were ready for a helicopter show in the early 80s. Blue Thunder hit theaters in 1983, serving up the perfect premise for a series. Highly advanced, military-style helicopter with turbo boost designed to escalate law enforcement capabilities falls into the wrong hands. You know, the hands of the government that created it. The system is broken and the only one who can fix it is a lone, altruistic Vietnam veteran suffering from PTSD working outside the law. He's gotta steal it back and mete out true justice. It is a common, popular narrative in early 80s fiction. 
Nation. Knight Rider began airing in 1982, setting the standard for the one-of-a-kind futuristic crime-fighting vehicle with support team slash family. It was only a matter of time before someone took the two concepts and put them together. In fact, two different productions tried to make Helicopter Knight Rider in 1984. Blue Thunder as an ongoing television series inspired by the movie and Airwolf. Both shows reset the premise of fear of a militarized police state to it's not the tool that's bad, it's the people using it. Despite ABC getting Blue Thunder on TV before Airwolf and having the support of the feature film and running opposite Riptide, a Magnum P.I. type show that also had a helicopter, Airwolf won the ratings battle. Blue Thunder cleared the airspace after only 11 episodes. Stringfellow Hawk was played by Jan Michael Vincent, who had been working in Hollywood since the 1960s. During its run, he was the highest paid actor on television, making $200,000 per episode. Dominic Santini was played by longtime character actor Ernest Borgnine. Ernest was a man that, for years as a kid, I thought was my uncle thanks to an autographed photo that hung in our living room. It never occurred to me until I was much older how weird it would have been to have an autographed photo of a family member, but this is a good time to remind everyone that kids are dumb. Airwolf's theme song was composed by Sylvester LeVay, who also handled the in-episode score for most of seasons one and two. Initially, the score was more orchestral in flavor, but it evolved into a more synthesized sound as the episodes in the totally radical 80s progressed. That job was then handed over to Udi Harpaz. Season one develops a narrative over the course of the season. Hawk and Santini have, technically, stolen a very expensive prototype weapon belonging to the US government. The firm, the CIA, the US government are both friend and foe, helping, but also pursuing, ready to reclaim Airwolf if possible. But in seasons two and three, CBS wanted to broaden the appeal of the show, lighten things up a bit, make it more appealing to the whole family. More Airwolf doing Airwolf stuff. Less espionage and intrigue, more blowing stuff up, and a softer, more diverse cast. Gene Bruce Scott was brought in to play Caitlin O'Shaughnessy, a Texas police helicopter pilot who pursued Hawk and Santini after an incident with a corrupt sheriff and his goons. She would eventually join the Airwolf crew as a flight engineer and sometimes pilot. Even with those changes, season three was the final season for Airwolf at CBS. Ratings were sliding, production cost was as high as ever, Jan Michael Vincent was struggling with alcoholism, creator and showrunner Belisario left the show, as did his wife Deborah Pratt, who played Archangel's associate Morella. In 1987, Airwolf was picked up by the USA Network with several cosmetic production and budgetary changes. With an eye towards syndication, they were looking to produce more episodes with less money. A new, more affordable, more reliable cast was brought in. Stringfellow Hawk appears in one episode to bridge the two networks. Santini is only seen from behind before dying in an explosion. Archangel is reassigned somewhere else. The firm is now the company. Airwolf is now led by Sinjin Hawk, Stringfellow's long-lost brother. Thanks to some creative writing, it turns out that he wasn't killed in action or rotting in a foreign prison. He was working deep undercover for the U.S. government. The reduced budget meant they no longer had the actual helicopter to shoot new flying sequences. All of those shots would be recycled from the previous three seasons. Even with the changes, Airwolf would be canceled after one season on USA. During its run on TV, Airwolf spilled into other media. In 1985, two books written by Ron Renault were published by W.H. Allen, Airwolf and Airwolf 2, Trouble from Within. Several scripts were adapted into books as well. There were coloring books and other content focused at kids. A UK magazine called Look In even included Airwolf comics. Airwolf hit the toy aisle as well, to varying degrees depending on the country you lived in. Several model kits were produced, as were die-cast versions of Airwolf itself. Ertl released both 148th and 164th scale toys. In Brazil, Glassleet released an assortment of figures and vehicles that could almost be defined as a wave. Locally branded as Aguia de Fogo, Glassleet recycled and repainted their Blue Thunder Frank Cheney action figure as Airwolf figures. New decos turned it into Stringfellow Hawk in Airwolf flight suit and casual wear. There was the Airwolf helicopter itself, as well as two different Jeeps scaled down so that they weren't compatible with the figures, but still legit Airwolf toys. 
The figures were released carded as part of the Heroes.TV line, which included figures from TJ Hooker, The A-Team, Street Hawk, and Knight Rider. Multiple companies licensed Airwolf to put on things like stamp sets, sticker books, you could even get an Airwolf wallet. And if I could, I would like to address the Airwolf stamp set, which featured six stampable images from Airwolf, only one of which was Airwolf itself. Kids had to find a way to get excited about an Ernest Borgnine stamp. <laughs> Airwolf computer games and sequels were released by Elite for the Commodore 64 in the UK and for the Amstrad CPC and the ZX Spectrum. There were versions for the BBC Micro and various Atari computer systems that were essentially just adapted from previously released versions of Blue Thunder. Other Airwolf games were exclusive to certain countries. An arcade game was released in Japan. It hit the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Genesis a few years after the series went into syndication. Although for the Sega Genesis, you may not have recognized it renamed as Crossfire. Back to its old flying sheepwolf tricks again. Today, Airwolf can still be found from time to time in syndication. There have been multiple VHS and Laserdisc releases, foreign and domestic, DVD releases, and depending on what country you live in, you may have even been able to catch re-edits released as feature-length motion pictures at your local cinema. Better yet, you can watch the entire series, all four seasons, for free after you're done watching this video on NBC's streaming service, Peacock. In 2015, Airwolf kind of returned in a series of comics produced by Lion Forge Comics distributed by IDW. Lion Forge Comics was new to the scene and attempted to make a solid first impression with a series of licensed nostalgia titles, including Miami Vice, Knight Rider, and Airwolf, among others. Airwolf Airstrikes was a series of loosely connected stories featuring some of the original characters as well as new characters and a new Airwolf that looked nothing like the original Airwolf. If you like helicopters, you may be interested. If you like Airwolf, you may be disappointed. Ernest Borgnine was 95 when he passed in July of 2012 due to kidney failure. Jan Michael Vincent continued to act and continued to struggle with drug and alcohol addiction. He was 74 when he died in February of 2019 after suffering cardiac arrest. Airwolf itself, the cosmetically modified Bell 222, was sold after the show was canceled. It was used for some time in Germany as an ambulance. However, in 1992, all three crew members at the time were killed when they lost their way during a storm and crashed. There is no film, no reboot, no nostalgia-powered return to Libya in the works. Hasbro has not made any announcements about a Transformers crossover figure. The fan community persists, but the future is unknown. Airwolf lives on as part of the pantheon of 1980s action-adventure television heroes, one of several shows featuring a super vehicle crusading for justice outside and sometimes against a cumbersome bureaucracy of law enforcement, empowering vigilantes to do what cannot be done by the corrupt administrations and profit-hungry corporations. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you haven't heard, we started a second channel called Toy Galaxy 2. That's T-O-O. Head over there and subscribe for stuff we don't post here. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy or become a YouTube channel member. Please share this video and let us know in the comments down below. If you were a member of the Airwolf flight crew, what would you be? Pilot? Flight engineer? Weapons specialist? String fellow? Every crew needs one. Why not you? <laughs>